Hello, just welcoming everybody. Tonight, our special guest is Professor Anna Moore, Director of the ANU Institute for Space. I'm Amanda Lynch, a Director of the AIIA ACT branch, and it's lovely to have Anna here with us. This event's a hybrid event where there are actually people in the uh, premises, and we've also got probably 100 people online, which is a wonderful audience. So thank you for joining us. Professor Moore will describe how Australia is uniquely positioned in the global space industry and the distinctive nature of our space industry. She'll reflect on how the space workforce will grow in the coming decade, including today's strong female leadership in the industry and how we can ensure more women leave university and obtain work in STEM careers. Professor Moore will explain why she views space as an inherently hopeful domain and we certainly need hope at the moment so <laughs> thank you so much for joining us Professor Moore. Oh, thank you very much Amanda it's really um, great to be here at the Australian Institute of International Affairs um, and, um, uh, and speaking with you all today. Um, so um, I think my story starts here quite recently so it's going to start in 2017 and I could have started this 60 years ago uh, if I wanted to, to go back and talk about what Australia has been doing uh, to aid the global space industry, space agencies, and you know, one can go back 65,000 years if you want to, if you want to talk about our first steps towards uh, uh, viewing space. But it's actually going to start very recently, mainly because a lot has happened in the last three years. So we'll start in 2017, and so um, which was shortly after I arrived. Uh, back here again in Australia, uh, in Canberra, and I, something very fortuitous happened to me. And I was um, asked by um, uh, Minister Arthur Sinodinos, who, who was at the time uh, Minister for um, Industry, Innovation and Science. I've probably got that wrong because it changes its name quite often, but I think that's what it was called three years ago. <clears throat> and um, he wanted to assemble uh, a small focused uh, expert reference group uh, focused on space and I was one of those seven people and Megan Clark was the chair of that panel and he asked us two questions the first question was what's Australia doing in the space industry number one what are we currently doing and number two was given given where you think or you believe the space industry is going um, where do you think Australia's strengths lie? There was no mention of a space agency. There was no space agency at the time. Uh, so try and remember that when you're when I'm talking about this. And so um, this was a great ex this was a great experience. Why? Because I got to straight away read 300 plus submissions from around the country, from uh, industry startups, primes university sector, government, etc., all listening to what they do in space and the space industry and what that means and how broad it is. Um, and um, so it leads me to my first point. My first point is that, you know, different people have different ideas of what space is. I'm often asked, well, what's the difference between space and astronomy? Uh, would you like to go to space? You know, uh, do you want to be the first woman on Mars or something like that? But so, so, um, so what I want to get across is that space. When we say space today, it's very broad. So, um, and so, uh, and most people don't appreciate uh, how they use space without knowing they use it. So everything from communications today to uh, weather forecasting to internet banking, all forms of communication, pretty much all forms of communication, earth observation, et cetera, is done with a space asset. And I think, so that's one of the main things I want to get across to start with. It, when we say space, it can encompass many different disciplines, many different fields. It's not just about exploration, which is why I, I often get asked this, not just by the public, but by many colleagues as well. What is what is the space industry? It's clearly very, very broad. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the second point to make is that, well, why was Arthur Sinodinos asking us to do this at this time? What, what is new space? What does that mean? Why is it different now to what it was before? 
And so and you might have heard of terms like space 2.0 and space, I'm not sure what number we're up to now, I think it's 4.0 or something, I've lost count myself. Um, but what, what does that really mean? And so I'd say around about 15 years ago, um, there was a paradigm change in the space industry and it was all to do with access to space. And so the likes of SpaceX and Rocket Labs and several other companies um, uh, somewhat bravely got up and said, we're gonna change how we, the paradigm for how we access space. And um, the result was that the cost to access space in recent years has dropped dramatically, you know, more than tenfold. And so what has that meant? Well, it's meant that um, where it used to be the realm of the government, heavily government funded state laboratories to access space and put assets in space. Yeah, that's how we've known space for the best part of 40 to 50 years. It now became accessible to everyone. Became accessible to not just research groups, but accessible to an individual who has an idea for how the business can be completely changed by having some kind of asset in space. And so it's not, the launch costs are not the only reason we had a huge change in, in how space is, is, um, uh, is occupied today. Um, but it was one of the biggest ones. Um, and so now what we're seeing in Australia, we have more startups in the space industry per capita than anywhere on the planet. If you look at what they're doing, uh, yes, some of them are being ambitious. They are saying, we're going to provide uh, a capability to um, uh, enable someone to do sample return from an asteroid. Okay, that's out there, right? And that's totally out there. But you've also got many companies who are doing things like, well, how do we make um, farming more efficient? How do we monitor cows without having to put fencing up, which is a big deal in Australia? Right, so how, how do we do that? How do we have fenceless farming? Um, how do we, uh, Internet of Things, how, how does that help us down here? How can we access space, use space as part of a business plan? You know, a venture capital funded business plan so that we can do things better here on the ground. And so that's one of the main reasons why this committee was put together. Australia had a huge amount of strengths in space, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it was the fact that also space itself, the space industry, through you know, four billion dollars in Australia by 2016, something like 40 billion uh, across the globe, projected to be one trillion in about 10 years' time. Um, that's how it was changing, and so we needed to know as a as a country, the government needed to know, well, how, how do we how do we um, uh, focus and adapt to be able to get some benefit from this. And so, um, uh, so um, the space agency was formed uh, as one of the outputs of this expert reference group. So it started in 2018, launched July 1st, 2018. Um, it has a, um, it, it had a mo very modest budget compared to global space agencies, but actually it wasn't as small as what people were projecting. So the government had already funded that year something like $300 million into space assets. And one of those big assets was uh, in an area called position, navigation, and timing. It was to use space and the ground to be able to know our location in Australia to three to five centimetres anywhere in Australia, as long as you had access to a mobile phone tower in the cities, uh, and even in rural areas, it was something like sort of uh, five to six centimeters. Um, so, uh, so even though there was some press around the modest at the time budget of the agency, actually, when you added up the civil investment, it was already about four or five hundred million dollars at that point in time. Um, so the agency has very strong uh, space industry growth KPIs. It wants to treble the industry by 2030. So go from $4 billion to $12 billion. It wants to create 20,000 new jobs associated with the space industry. And you might think at first that's pretty ambitious, but when you understand that the space industry is very as broad as it is, um, that's actually quite, that's quite possible. Um, so going back to that expert reference group, what is it in Australia that we can stand up and say, we are leading in, in the space industry? Um, and our advantages come in two ways. So the first is both 
geographical and uh, and the land size of Australia. So um, Australia is a huge land mass, both in both this way and that way, both in longitude and in latitude. And that by itself has huge advantages. So if we pick an area of civil space priority called advanced communications, uh, a very important uh, area that's changing itself. We, we currently use what's called radio frequencies right now to communicate pretty much across the board. Optical fiber under the ground or under the oceans, radio frequencies everywhere else. The next generation of communications will be um, not using radio, it'll be using optical light. Not that our eyes can see, but basically the same thing, lasers to communicate. Um, we want to do this because we know you can't hack it. We want to do this because you can, you can transmit huge amounts of information. So point to point, terabit per second between any two people on the planet. So imagine that. That's basically a, almost a revolution like the internet was in you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so why is, Australia, why is this good for Australia? Well, optical communications needs clear skies. It needs large landmass to be able to communicate. Um, and so Australia is perfectly set up to be that, as, as it were, that hub, not only for the global community, but for, in the future, the solar system. And I know you might think I'm going too far out here, but it is my job, right? So in the future, there will be solar system communications. There'll be a network. And what we want today is that Australia will be that, that data stream down to the earth channeling being that channel of communication to the rest of the solar system so imagine that for a minute that would be outstanding but enabled simply because of the geography of the, of the country and its location and another a, a key area is what's called space situational awareness now that's a long phrase but it, you can think of it as being traffic management of the skies in space so a bit like the what we do now with, um, well, maybe not so much what we do now, what we did do with planes, you know, how do we know where they are and all this kind of thing? How do we know they're not gonna crash or where, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, there's very little of that done in space right now. And that's a major issue because satellites go at 10 kilometers per second. So any issue up there creates a huge amount of, of debris, a uh, huge amount of problem. Uh, it's not just contaminating one area above one country or one location or contaminate the whole system. And so being able to provide a, um, uh, a real-time uh, traffic management, it sounds very boring, I'm sorry, but a real-time traffic management of what's happening up in space, being able to make sure that accountability is there, being able to make sure if something goes wrong, someone is there, to blame, that sounds terrible, but someone is accountable for that who did that. And making sure we don't have any of those major collision issues is a, it's not just important, it's mandatory for the growth of the space industry. And so why is Australia such a key component here? Well, one of the reasons is because of that clear sky, large extent. It's already actually a global leader in this area, monitoring the heavens uh, for the benefit of the global community. And it's also where um, it will expand into in, in the future. So they're just two, two snapshot reasons why geographically and land size, Australia is absolutely perfectly suited to not just be a, a player, but to lead these areas as we move forward. Um, uh, and then there's a catch all for everything else, which I'll put under it. Australia has a um, a very strong and very well respected um, uh, research community in many areas, health and medicine, food, agriculture, uh, not just in physics and tech, um, legal, regulatory. And all of these things are critical for the future of space. Um, and so, um, uh, so it's that uh, you know, um, high level of education, that high level of, of R&D output that Australia has on the world stage is another reason why um, the space industry will, you know, it's, it's, it's important for the growth of the space industry in, into the future. And as I'm at the um, 
Institute of International Affairs, I'm going to bring something up that normally I might say later if I was talking to a more um, uh, 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 techie is not the right word. I'm sure you're all very techie, but uh, anyway, so I'm going to bring it up straight away because it's, a, it's also, it's one of the biggest issues is, is on the, the legal regulation side, internationally and domestic. And so the nature of space, as I said, has changed. It's now, which is great for growth in space industry and economy and manufacturing and everything else. But it also brings with it a whole bunch of um, moral and legal questions that need to be answered, that need to catch up with what's happening in the technical side. And I think the audience would be able to educate me much better on how technological advances do they always come ahead of frameworks and legal in the legal side of things we're very happy to hear your thoughts on that but certainly in the area of space there's a lag definitely not just in what, when i talk about space situation awareness um but just in things like uh, accountability venture capital launch licensing um questions that need to be asked about why we do things. What does this really mean? It's great to do things because you can. Is that really what we should be doing today? Have we not learned a little bit in the past about how we should be asking the why just a little bit earlier to make sure that we, we can stand up and say, we're doing this the right way. So, um, so that's one of the biggest areas of um, discussion and in a way much, much harder than the technical stuff that I tend to do <laughs> most of the time. I find that actually quite challenging. But then again, it's also somewhat, somewhat um, uh, maybe surprising is that um, the international community is looking to countries like Australia that do not have strong prime history, primes being um, I don't know what they call primes, but industry, large industries like Boeing and um, uh, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman. It doesn't have that, that sort of political, um, I would say it's the most delicate way. It doesn't have a kind of political history. It's able to be quite objective, be able to not really be too concerned about that and to do things for the right reason. So in fact, somewhat paradoxically, the international community the bigger players are looking to countries like Australia, Luxembourg, etc., to set those legal frameworks of the future, which is so so important for how we how we develop in the future. Um, and just to finish off, um, uh, so um, three things: one, if I still haven't convinced you, the space industry is exciting; it's growing, and Australia has a big part to play. Uh, we also need it. So. Um, here in Australia. So um, the story about bushfires, for example, it will not be solved holistically and um, completely without assets in space. So an asset in space can give you constant surveillance of Australia. You can pick up a fire in just a few minutes and do something about it. That is absolutely not the only solution. This is a huge story which needs a holistic approach and that's what's happening, which is, which is superb. But without the technical asset in space, you won't be able to you, know, you won't be able to do what you need to do for Australia in the future. For areas such as climate change, of course, uh, assuming there is not two presidents moving forward, I am an American, so I'm finding this very interesting. Uh, so um, uh, you know, hopefully that we we really do need to have more assets doing climate change and monitoring as well. Um, so um, there are some real pertinent reasons here on the ground why we need to have those assets in space and um, developing that community here. Um, uh, um, so as we mentioned STEM before, and not just STEM, uh, uh, just really bringing diversity into our industries. Um, so um, my organization in space is a very, I, right from the get-go, wanted to make it very diverse, uh, not just discipline diverse. Our teams are made up of everyone from the humanities, you know, economics, law, STEM, science. So our, um, we bring those teams together and we listen to each, to each other. And really what you end up with then is a much more holistic solution at the end of the day. It's not just something that's a piece of tech that sounds great. We actually know where it's going and do we need it? Why do we need it? Can it go off to something else? 
what whatever it was, what's the other stuff you need to get this working? What about the economic story, the business story? Um, so what we're doing is much more transformative for Australia than what we would be doing as just individual researchers. But also because I was starting something new, I could I could um, uh, I could do things differently. And so we currently have 75% women uh, diverse gender diversity in the institute of about 40, 50 people, um, and um, which wasn't that difficult to do, I have to say. Um, and I think I hadn't aimed to do that. I mean, 50% was fantastic for me. Um, uh, my goal was 30, you know, so, so how did I get to 75? Well, well, I think when you start, you start with the, the big goals and you put the first steps in place, you're giving the message that actually you do take this seriously. It was very easy to then do hiring where when a woman came along, she made the effort to go for it because she knew she'd be taken seriously when she came in. And so again, now I'm, I'm almost at the opposite end. I'm, I'm, I'm a male gender minority, that's a joke, but, but that's, you know, I think about these things, right? Um, uh, but space, um, uh, in Australia in particular, if you look at the leaders in space, uh, it's this wonderful opportunity to give that gender diversity me message out. So the head of the agency, Megan Clark, the minister in charge of the, of the agency, uh, her portfolio is Karen, Minister Karen Andrews, Tanya Monroe's chief defense scientist. I could go on. Um, a lot of the startup um, uh, community of uh, uh, young women um, who, were, who were going out there and being supported to do what they want to do. Um, we still have major issues, especially in the technical side of things. Um, but um, it's one of those it's one of those areas that you can point to today and say, that's actually, wow, that's a really good starting point. We can really start to do something different. Um, and um, lastly, um, uh, I think um, we need to focus on how we how we steer our country and our community out of COVID. Um, I think we were having these issues before COVID, to be honest. I think how do we how do we um, uh, pivot to a more building a lot more in our own country than what we're currently doing, um, diversifying our economy. That's just been th thrown a real spotlight on it since COVID, right? So um, the government has uh, um, identified space with, with one of those um, economic growth areas, um, which has been, uh, you know, universally adopted by our community of research researchers and um, uh, industry, uh, state governments, national governments together. It's very much a unified community, um, which is important because if it wasn't, it, it won't work. And so as an astronomer, I can say astro astronomy, astron astronomy is top in the world because it's a unified community. There's no state boundaries. They, when you go to government, you go to, you go to government together. You go with three things and you all agree with it. There's no dissent. And you and that's I'm, I'm actually not too far from the truth we learned that many years ago um, and so it's important that the space community do the same thing um, and I'm, I'm you know proud to say what I'm seeing so far is a very unified uh, community let's keep our fingers crossed there because that's what it will take to uh, compete in this um, competitive global landscape moving forward mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Moore. And it's a very interesting area with so many different aspects. So it will just uh, move on to the questions. And there are a lot of questions. So um, I'll just kick off with uh, a question about the ANU and mm -hmm. what sets it apart in terms of other universities uh, in the space area. And also what innovative research is happening at ANU as well in other disciplines. Um, so, um, uh, one of the reasons I set up in space the Institute was because when I was on the, the expert reference group, I read 32 submissions from ANU, of which none of them knew anyone else. They just, they were doing their thing. It's amazing. We had groups who were leading space medicine. You know, how do we protect the next generation of humans going into space? If, if, if space travel opens up, which it will, they won't be vetted by health, it'll be by who can pay. Okay, so you, your health system has to keep up with that. 
not just that, how do we get to the moon, how do we get to Mars? So space medicine was one of those, uh, space law. Um, we had groups who are doing bushfire mitigation, groups that are measuring water, bulk water movement uh, from Antarctica, Greenland, Australia as well, just by having ultra precise spacecraft uh, uh, that are measuring gravitational anomalies, super cool. Um, and so we had all these different groups of which none of them really knew anyone else. And so I was reading this going, this is just, it's like my own little mini NASA, you know, I had my own, my own little mini sort of space agency in ANU where you had these amazing groups that just, just needed some coordination investment. Um, and so that, you know, that, that was, that's one of the main strengths of, of ANU is it has that broad um, disciplinary diversity. It has strong capability in each of those. Fantastic. And we'll take a few questions in the room and then I'll go online for other questions. So if you could stand up and introduce yourself um, before asking a question. We'd love to. Brian. Yeah, Brian Ely, uh, council member of the ACT branch. Um, seems that uh, more and more private enterprise is getting into the, the space uh, issue including Elon Musk and et cetera. How much is, is your um, organisation going to have to work with the um, uh, commercial world to uh, get things really moving here? And are they interested? Oh, um, a lot and yeah. yes. Right. Don't expand. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, we already are. So um, I think gone are the days where you try and do something by yourself in in, in something like the space industry. And not just that, the message from the government is that we've got to start working together with industry. And that's not necessarily something the university sector is um, brilliant at. Um, it, there are isolated cases, especially some of the, I would say some of the newer universities have, have been forced to do that because they don't maybe don't have the income streams of the more traditional ones. And so they've really just thought outside the box and they've really got that working. And so I think some of the more traditional universities can look at that and go, actually, that's what we need to do. But from InSpace's perspective, we have um, practically every single one of our missions is linked with, with um, industry, both small and big. We also use um, some, of, not use, I shouldn't say that. So we work with a lot of primes too, with, to get the space education part of it right as well. So we're looking at how we can change the paradigm here in terms of training. <clears throat> You know, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be black and white anymore. You know, there's, um, you know, if we really do want to support that growing space um, industry, we've got to, you know, we've got to produce the pipeline of people coming through that go out into industry. And so we've got to have those m much more, much more numerous connections. Uh, it's not just black and white, it's a big gray area in the middle where we're, we're doing things together. So a lot really is the, is the short answer. And I think anything you can do in industry, you do it in industry. You do it in the startups. If they can do it, you do it. You should think, you should be bold. And then it's the, the biggest stuff, the stuff that's going to get Australia ahead in 20 years or 50 years. That's what's happening in the university sector. Oh. Hi, I'm Paul Lindwall, Commissioner at the Productivity Commission. Um, when I did an inquiry a little while back, uh, we were looking at um, telecommunications and the geostationary orbit where the satellites are above the equator um, at a fixed amount. There's only a limited number of space there, I guess, mm -hmm. because they're quite cluttered at the moment for GPS and so on. Mm -hmm. Are we moving to different options rather than having all the satellites at geostationary orbit? Yes, so absolutely. For GPS, etc. Absolutely. And so, um, so there are two areas that are, um, you'll hear about a lot of it. One's called VO low earth orbit and one's MEO, mid earth orbit. So low earth orbit is if you can do something in LEO, you do it in LEO. Why? Because it's cheaper to get there. So each one of these orbits uh, takes a certain amount, sorry, we sound so physics -y, but, but it takes a certain amount of energy to get to each one. The further you are away, the more energy it takes to get there. So if you can do something with a smaller constellation in low earth orbit, you do it because it's much cheaper to do. And often you can get free rides because someone's going out to geo anyway. Um, so, um, but I think what there are other benefits of occupying those orbits, um, and um, uh, especially Mio is, is particularly uncluttered right now. So I think you'll start to see a lot of, um, you know, uh, 
agile defense solutions, in particular going, going there, for example. Um, and um, uh, uh, because you can replace things quite quickly, you can do real time, anything real time there as well. Um, and it's just they're much cheaper missions. And they're much harder to take out. Sorry, to be, just from a sovereign perspective, they're harder to take out. Hmm. I'll just ask a question online. That's a very interesting question from Thomas. Um, is there a need for individuals to forfeit aspects of individual privacy to take full advantage of space technology? So it's the uh, the privacy aspects which are coming up a lot with, with Amazon and with some of the other um, big corporates. So is that an issue with space? Uh, Google um, Earth's another example. Yes, I, I mean, I think, I think we're entering that already, aren't we? To some extent. Um, so um, uh, I think that's, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I mean, you've got, it's not just Google Earth. Um, I mean, you've got the, you know, the cars, the automated cars that take pictures of, of uh, your, your street. And I often check, you know, is my, how's my car doing? I'll just look online. And think, so, yeah, I mean, this is very much now. It would, and I think space is quite right. Space will, will um, only expand that. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, in some areas it provides security. I mean, in the area of, I was talking about this next generation communications that allows anyone's communication to be totally unhackable. As in, only the person you want to send this signal to will get it and be able to decode it. Anyone who tries to decode that signal, um, when well, I'm saying the signal, I mean, it could be an image, a video call, it could be anything. When anyone tries to intercept that, the signal just disappears. And so, um, so this is just that's just pure physics, the way the lasers work and are encoded. So um, I could answer that question two ways. Yes, of course, the more surveillance you have in, in space, the, the more our privacy is, um, is, uh, is um, eradicated. But it's also, there are also opportunities whereby actually we may end up with totally private forms of communication, not just government to government or defense to defense or whatever, I'm talking person to person. So it's, sorry, that's a very hard question to answer. Yeah, yes, yes for both, I think. And there was another question from Christopher Skinner. Mm -hmm. Is there an international body that regulates or coordinates the space activities of countries and companies to minimize mutual interference? Um, I'm going to have to do my best here because I'm not a space lawyer. So I'm going to preface my answer with that. Um, hopefully one of our space lawyers can come and give a whole session on space law um, and you can interrogate them. But um, so there are international bodies that um, uh, are, um, uh, you know, um, coming up with global uh, standards for how we operate in space you know if you go to an asteroid do you own it can you just can you take samples no matter this or the, own, the ownership perspective there are discussions about that um, there are standards for each country about ins insurance right now if you launch something and it damages something it's that country that's responsible for that for example and no matter where it comes down so this there are rules like that that, that are there However, is it enough for this exponentially growing commercialization of space? I don't think so. I think we're a long way off that. And I think it's important. So the Dean of the College of Law at ANU explained this to me, thanks to her patience, explaining to an astronomer um, some of these uh, technicalities. But she explained it as, as um, you know, if you think about uh, why in New York and London, for example, financial hubs, they didn't just spring it, you know, into existence as being strong international financial hubs. They had the international frameworks, the first, you know, they, they were there with their ability to do that. And it's very similar to space here, the first country that gets those frameworks, right, that enables that commercialization of space in a, in a you know, in a, a, a workable way uh, is going to take the advantage. Thank you. I'll go with Sarah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sarah from Prana's uh, Cambridge University. I was just wondering what potential security or national security threats um, could come out of space um, commercialization or colonization? 
Oh, okay. Um, so, um, uh, so, so with advances in things like AI and better communications, forget space. There's a whole sector on national security and cyber security. Hacked up with Australian, we know that. Uh, ANU knows that for sure. We get hacked all the time. And these things are getting more sophisticated. So, it, so space is going, I mean, to some extent, I suppose that's just going to expand that if we do nothing about it. Um, I'm using the same answer twice. I apologize in advance. Okay. But if we do yeah. get the, um, the uh, quantum enabled communications up and running quickly, that's no longer possible uh, to do that. And so, um, and that's not as far off as we might think. So there, there is a, a physics solution. There is a solution whereby um, you can uh, effectively get unhackable communications, yeah. no matter what type of supercomputer you have doing it, or even just a PC on someone's yeah, yeah, desk, yeah. which is what's happening now. Um, and your last question was about um, colonization. Colonization in terms of national security. Oh, in space specifically. Um, uh so i i don't think i think there'll be a problem before colonization right? yeah. I, I think it's it's having the access to space um you know uh i mean you know the, the us has always had the most sophisticated assets in space always it's never underspent in that area right for good reason and i i think that's just going to keep going just even just from pure surveillance perspective um, so I, I think um, uh, I, I think I think just having you know next gen technology in space as it keeps expanding. You're talking about you know communications around the moon, surveillance beyond the moon, looking back. So these are this is going to be interesting times. I think for that um, colonization, I, I'm not. Yeah, I think it's got its own issues, right. but I don't know if that's necessarily national security. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Robert Johnson, a member of the local branch. Um, the Space Age mm -hmm. started in about 1950. Mm -hmm. Okay, 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it's been focused on most of all is militarism, mm -hmm. missiles. Now, um, you've got four or five really big powers mm -hmm. on to the chief mm -hmm. and ready to conduct the space war. Now, is it part of your, uh, your uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it part Agenda? of your instructions to try and do something to calm this situation down? Um, no, short answer. Um, but I think I think those conversations are getting much more outside of the defense. I mean, they're much more open about those discussions these days than what they used to be, I have to say, which, which is, I think, a really good thing. Um, I don't think it's missiles, okay? I don't think we're looking at missiles in space. That's not your biggest worry. I mean, we the whole world's come to a standstill because of the virus. I... You know, I think it's going to be about um, control of assets, interference of assets that a country absolutely relies on. And so, for example, in Australia, Australian defence relies so heavily on everyone else's assets. If it suddenly lost all of that, we're in deep doo doo here in Australia, right? I mean, we depend so much on on everyone else. And so, and I'm not saying that's going to change specifically, but I, but I think. Um, uh, it's access to those assets that, in or lack of it, that actually can cause way more damage than someone sending a missile out and taking a satellite. Now. So, um, oh, no, no, that's okay. We've got quite a few online. But thank so, you. So, I, I, I yeah. think, I think that, um, I think discussion. I mean, remember now, everyone's got access to space, and I think that's almost more interesting, and that's they're more along the lines of discussions that that we have. Because it's 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 democratized. That was word. I'm not sure that's even word. But it's, it's democratized. But that brings positives and negatives. 
We've got a very interesting question here about philosophy from Matthew. Um, and he mentioned the humanities, law and economics um, were mentioned. What role um, or relationship do you have with philosophers? The number of ethical questions about exploring space. Uh, what value should we place on the environment in space? Is there a duty to protect the environment? Um, and what happens if we encounter terrestrial organisms? Can we take these? Should we treat other planets with respect? What counts as violation? Should we develop technology to drill asteroids? Which seems to be the direction. Right, okay. Some That's a lot of going. questions. Yeah. So I, I think the- They're all related. Um, I think I can answer that in one goes to say, I think if, if we ignore the ethics of what we're doing, I think we'll just end up back where, where we are with the earth. So I think we need to do things differently. And we need to take that pause and say, okay, just because you can do something, have you really thought what this is going to do? And it doesn't mean you're going to stop doing it. It just means that you're prepared for what might happen. So, you know, if you think back to the, the internet, you know, the first, when it was developed at Stanford, a research group, right? They developed a communication system for the university, right? No, you know. And, and so, but did anyone then ask, if this took off, how is it going to change the world? How's the internet going to change the world? All the all the great positives, all the all the negatives, you know, and and so um, and so I so I that's what I try and do with with in space by having this multidisciplinary approach. When we have something, when someone says, invariably it's someone from the sciences. I've got something that's going to win a Nobel Prize and it's going to change the world. Okay, great. Okay, but let's let's just pause here a minute and let's think this through. Like what, what is it? What is what? What is this really going to do? And quite often, the most important, the most challenging questions that are asked are not from the scientists; mm -hmm. they're from the other disciplines, mm -hmm. who I assume know a lot better. In that sense, <laughs> I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I, I totally, mm -hmm. I totally agree that we should be focused. You know, we should ask these these questions and not think that they're just on the side or that they're not. Mm -hmm they actually don't matter because they do matter. Because yeah. a business case today, which is to do something, you know, um, it's like the, the Mr. Fluffy story. Is that right? Have I got that right? The asbestos story, okay. <clears throat> I mean, how much that cost to repair? Did anyone think about that when they funded the, I mean, I've never met Mr. Fluffy, that's a person, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like you must understand the consequences of what you're doing to fully understand what the, what the economics of it is. And I think that gets to things like asteroid mining and, and things like that. There's a, quadri a quadrillion dollars in the asteroid belt. It's a phenomenal amount. And we will go there as a human race and we will mine it. We will build cities in space. You know, that will happen eventually. Um, but can we learn at least from how we've done things in the past? Yes, we should. Hi, Peter McCauley, Australian National University. Uh, I do a lot of work on Indonesia. Um, but here we're from the Institute of International Affairs. So I've got a question about the region, yes. Asia. Yes. Um, first, uh, they're really related. What about Japan? You haven't mentioned. I, I guess we have links with Japan. Japan mm -hmm. is the, uh, I guess, the number one, the richest country in the region with scientific uh, expertise and so on. First. Second, China. Yes. There's presumably li links here with China, mm -hmm. pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about China? And third, perhaps of particular interest, is Southeast Asia. I'm particularly thinking about Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Listening to what you've said, uh, from the Indonesian point of view, there are quite a few threats here. They're threats. It means that Australia and the rich world will have much improved capacity to monitor what is going on inside Indonesia. For example, before you mentioned bushfires, forest fires. Mm -hmm. This is embarrassing for Indonesia, and it's a problem for the region. But if Australia has all of the information, we will gather the information, there'll be an information asymmetry. It exacerbates the relationship between the countries mm -hmm. because we will have information that we're not prepared to share with them. And they will know that we have information that we're not going to share. Or we might put it into the media, which then becomes embarrassing. Could you comment on those hmm. issues? Please? Okay. So, um, uh, so, um, Okay, Japan. So um, the, the Space Agency uh, has signed a series of international agreements for increased collaboration and has signed 
uh, Japan was one of the, um, uh, I think, second round of arrangements that was that was signed. That that was signed. Um, from my institute's perspective, we've been working with JAXA right from day one. So um, uh, because they have tremendous capability, um, uh, long history, uh, which we which we needed, and uh, which we still need, and so um, so I think it's 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 inevitable that the Japan and Australia will will be doing things together and. and it's um, interesting if you look at Japan because it's only recently that they have pivoted to growing an industry around space. So up until now, a lot of the funding has gone to JAXA to do things without a commercial, um, uh, you know, a frame of mind. Which I mean, it's probably quite surprising because um, because it has such a you know thriving uh, commercial in industry in other areas. But it's only recently they started doing that with space. And so again, that's a nice synergy between the two countries. So. Um, so uh, um, Japan's um, uh, National Institute for Communications is one of our main uh, supporters of uh, the Australasian Grand Station Network, an optical Grand Station Network that we want to do in this region, starting in Australia, because we we got the money to do so. But they want they wanted to expand across the region. So if you're talking about civil domains like communications, advanced communications, earth observation, robotics and automation and things. There's, there's no issue to work with any of those countries. And we and we are very much so, um, with one exception, and that's China. And so there's a, um, as an astronomer, I work with, I've got Chinese colleagues and collaborators for decades. We've been working together for for years doing instrumentation together, it's regarded as safe by our, by, our community, by the government, basically. We're doing things together that don't have any dual use. It's about exploring the universe, right? And it's accepted. Um, but on the space side, there's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult right now. Uh, sorry, and then on so it's the more and um, the power imbalance. Pa the power imbalance. I I um, I haven't heard a single civil civil mission like say um, you know, bushfire mitigation, for example, where the data wouldn't just be made freely available. Um, uh, unless there's some kind of business case around it where that data will be sold, and, and you know something like that. Fair enough, but but I just. Um, I don't, you know, this, I think we've learned so many lessons. The international community has learned so many lessons about making this kind of data available to everyone. So uh, NASA does this all the time. The, the Sentinel missions from the European Union, you know, multi-billion dollar missions that have been upgraded, you know, year after year. All that data is freely available to, to whomever wants to see it. So I think from the civil earth monitoring perspective, um, I. I don't have any, um, I, I haven't heard or I, I, I just don't see any issue with that data being made freely available as it should. Of course, sovereign perspective, sovereign data or data that's regarded as highly classified, which usually means high spatial resolution data. Um, that's a different story. But that's not what you do with Bush. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Professor. Thank you very much for a uh, very informative uh, discussion. Um, look, you've covered a number of things, uh, such as the, the need for a regulatory framework, if you like, um, the challenges to do with uh, possibly the exploitation and how we use space, um, as we discussed, the sort of relationships between uh, countries that are engaged in space. I'd like to put a, just another spin on mm -hmm. things, if, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I, I, dare I say it, but you're in a really exciting time um, in your position as a scientist and as an astronomer when we seem to be opening up our knowledge of not just our immediate area, it's, you know, we're, we're getting close up images of the rings of Saturn, we're finding water on the moon, we're, we're exploring Mars, we're, and we're looking beyond that right out into the universe. And so it must be for you and for there are others to come a really exciting time to be involved in in space generally. 
what would be your sort of the next thing that you would like to see, the next eureka moment for you in terms of that exploration and discovery? Oh. As a, as a scientist and oh, as wow. an astronomer. Um, that's, a, that's a really hard question. Um, I'd like a Nobel Prize, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> My VC has one. Um, no, I, gosh, I, um, I'd like to see, that's such a good question. I could answer it in so many ways. I, I'd like to see, I'd really like to see, given the situation we're in today, I could answer that with being okay. I'd love to see a colony, a sustainable human presence on the moon. I'd love to see the first person back on the moon again is a woman. I, you know, I, um, uh, I'd love to be able, you know, to be able to see that we've identified life on another planet. I could go in so, so many directions, yeah. Um, but I, given the situation we're in today, I, and what we need, I, I'd like, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see space to be in, in growing an industry together for real, re, for really important reasons, right? Growing our global economy again after a debilitating period, um, as a way to bring together, um, you know, the Southeast Asia re region together and doing things together. I think in you know, future space elevators, I remember giving an ABC um, podcast once on where, where's Australia in 50 years. And one of those answers was, was well, I would love to, um, it won't be in 50 years, it'll be more, but access to space via what's called a space elevator. Okay. And these are things that have been around for a very long time because conceptually they're very simple. But engineering wise, they're extremely difficult. Okay, and it would need a whole region, a whole region coming together to do this, not one country. It would be a whole region having to come together to do it. And for, and for various reasons, the equator and the Southeast Asia region, in actually not far from Indonesia, is exactly where you'd put one. And imagine how that would change the world. Um, so you know, completely different. If you want to grow a city in space, that's how you do it. You don't do it with rockets. You do it with something like this. So I, I, I see space as, you know, I hope space does something like that. You know, it, it, it brings together a much needed community, global community, which frankly, we kind of need right now. I hope, I hope that's what you're after. But um, today, that's what I think. We've got a couple more questions online. Um, it seems to be an Australian practice, this is from Christopher, to engage government with academia, but not to work with industry. How will the space agency engage with industry, existing or encouraging startups? Um, well, I'd say that they've done a very good job already. I think, honestly, the university sector is feeling pretty left out right now, if you had to ask them, which is not true. But I think that that's how they would see it. So um, look, it's very clear the agency's there to grow space industry. It's its number one um, KPI, key performance indicator, is that industry growth. If it doesn't do that, it will fail. And so it has to. Um, so you'll see that in its recent, in its funding, the funding that it has given so far is is um, almost all of it has gone to industry. And whether that's led by a university group for, for good reason, the um, the majority of the funding itself has gone to an industry partner who is doing the work. Okay, and so and we'll see that with the 150 million investment to the Moon to Mars Artemis, I, I strongly suspect, and I think this is right. You know, the, the the teams that will be successful there will be industry led, or where it's industry itself that's getting ahead. And so um, I don't think the government's been, uh, or at least the government that I've seen and I work with, they have not been shy here. They are absolutely first and foremost saying it's their job to grow industry. And the university sector has a part to play, a big part. We need to get our research out. We need to train the next generation workforce. Okay, we've got to be starting to do things like in the European community maybe that we're just not doing right now. Um, but I would say the agencies are already stepped up and been very clear about its role for industry growth. And then Joshua is asking about uh, the defence relationship. Mm -hmm. um, the Royal Australian Air Force and the University of New South Wales launched the Pathfinder satellites in July 
So what level of collaboration may occur between the RAF and the space agency and how can national security and defence interests of Australia be achieved by the space agency? Um, so um, the agency has um, uh, um, some, well, actually quite, I would say quite, for an agency, it has quite um, uh, a few areas of conversation, shall we say, between defence and them, where, where um, funding can be co-invested to do similar things, where there are civil priorities that overlap with defence priorities. I think they're, they've made a good, they've done a good job of being able to try and understand what those defence capability managers are after. Um, of course, most of the but most of the significant budget so far for space investment lies with defence. So seven billion for communications, uh, two uh, that's right, two billion for um, sorry, seven billion for observation surveillance, two billion for communications. These are these are big numbers for the Australian community. So we'll see how that goes. You know, will defence go to just end up going to a to a capability offshore and not grow the local um, industry. I don't think so. I think that's a that's a mistake. It's a weakness. But um, uh, we'll we will see mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And there's a really interesting question from Ryan too about space launches in Australia's future. Mm -hmm. um, with SpaceX announced a while back that they seek to build a launch centre in the Northern Territory mm -hmm. because of our geography. Mm -hmm. Do you think others will follow and will there be many space launches in Australia? Oh, so um, we have, we already have three companies that are um, as, uh, establishing launch facilities from Australia. So one of the, you know, I mentioned earlier that Australia is unique in its size, longitude, latitude. Um, this applies to launch. So Australia is one of the only places where you can launch into what's called an equatorial orbit. Very important for um, countries that sit on the equatorial belt. Why would you do that? Because it's cheap. If you can be already be on the equator, as in the Northern Territory, you get that extra spin of the earth and it makes the launch a lot cheaper. So Australia can do that from the Northern Territory. It has another company in Queensland called Gilmore that's focusing from launches there. Um, and in Southern, in South Australia, apologies, the Southern launch, which can actually launch into polar orbits. Which a lot of you know a lot of obs both observation is done from polar orbit. So Australia is a country that actually it's it's got a huge coastline, huge open spaces. It has the ability to launch into different orbits. It's it's quite it's uh, it's very unique. So yes, it's already happening. I think is the phrase. So we've got time for one more question from the floor here. Did you want to ask a question, Norman? <coughs> Whether. Australia the major space providers. I'm sorry? Australia. Mm -hmm. Within Australia, the space providers. What are the major space yes. providers in Australia? Well, so the biggest company doing space related activities is EOS, as in a domestic, uh, solely owned domestic company. So that's Electro Optic Systems. Um, and they have, they have a space segment, communications segment too. Um, so that's probably the biggest one from an export perspective. But then after then, it gets quite small. And so there's a whole bunch of smaller um, um, you know, SMEs and smaller uh, startups in, in, in that bracket. Uh, but it's, there's a whole conversation. I'm sure this happens in other disciplines, right? But how do we, how do we grow what's down here into the larger companies in the future? Um, so it's, there's a whole bunch down at this level. And then there's only a few up at the top of which EOS is probably the biggest. Hmm. When do you expect the first person to walk on Mars? Oh, well, they'll have to get there first. Yeah. So, so that's hard. There might be one way, surely. Uh, <laughs> um, it, so it's... Getting someone to the moon, it, it's not easy, but um, it, it, it's a lot easier, a few days. Um, uh, Mars is totally different kettle of fish, so nine months to get there. Um, so you're talking about having to grow your own food, you're talking about um, 
the um, the impacts of the zero gravity human beings evolved with, with one g gravity okay so when you take it away we start to have issues um and so there's a whole health sort of um uh, around that too um the energy required to get there as well um that, to do all these other things is so there's there's there's, there's um uh, not insurmountable, but com I'm just compared to going to moon first. It, it is a it is a different kettle of fish. But you asked me a question, so I um, plenty of people will will try it. I don't think they even think about coming back. So I think I think um, could it be less than ten years? Oh, I don't think it's possible. Sustainably, that's different. That's a very good note to finish. So it's a bit depressing, isn't it? Tomorrow. To finish tonight's presentation. But, uh, thank you so much, Professor Moore. We're just delighted that you could join us. And it's just such an interesting, engaging topic and and one that's just got so much potential. We'll have to follow this up with, and with other speakers. Um, it's just wonderful. And I think all those... Girl, little girls out there, you know, study their STEM topics and they could end up to be Australia's first female astronaut. So I, I really love the way that you're focusing too on the development of, uh, of young women and uh, future careers in space. It's so exciting. So thanks again for joining us this evening. It's and my pleasure. Thank you to the audience. And there's so many questions that haven't been answered, but uh, we really appreciate you, you sending them in. Thank you again.